Hey, it's great to see you guys here. Um, I'm excited as we continue on our series called King of Thrones. And we're going to be taking a look at um, another beatitude. And that's going to be found in chapter 5, uh, chap uh, chapter 5, in verses 10 through 12. And so we're going to be looking at persecution today, which is not a popular message to be uh, preaching, right? Uh, but we're going to take a look at persecution and what it means and how Jesus looked at it and defined it and then how we can handle it and, and, and how, what it produces within us or can produce within us. So here in a few moments we'll get into that, but we're going to spend a few moments singing a song. So if you would, just take a minute and uh, just really lean in and, and sing this song with us. Before we do that, let me lead us into a word of prayer and just ask God to bless our time together as we worship Him and bring Him glory today. If you would, just bow your heads and your hearts where you're at, and let me lead us into a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for the beautiful weather that we've been having. We just pray that uh, that uh, it would just warm our souls, and it's, it's, it feels like such a great medicine. Um, but more importantly, I pray today as we gather together through Spirit, that we would just lift you up and bring you glory, that we would exalt your Son, Jesus. And so I pray your spirit would be with us. I pray your spirit would give us eyes to see things, ears to hear things, a heart to absorb it, and the strength, tenacity, the, the, uh, uh, the, the desire uh, to pursue it, uh, to allow you to sit on the throne of our hearts. Be with us. Receive our praise. May you be glorified in all that we do and say. And I pray all this in the most powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Who you are, way 
maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who. Again, it's great to see each and every one of you, and I'm excited to be here and to uh, talk to you. The weather's getting awesome. Wanted to come outside. The weather's getting really awesome. Hopefully, you're enjoying it. Hopefully, you're getting out uh, as much as we can and just kind of taking walks and just enjoying the warm weather. What great medicine it is, right? Hey, if you would, would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 12. We're in a series called King of Thrones. And in this series, uh, we're looking at, we're looking at uh, Matthew's writings, the uh, Gospel of Matthew. And um, throughout his Gospel, the Gospel of Matthew, what he's trying to communicate to his audience, if you remember, we've talked about this, if you've uh, been a part of it, of us, uh, of, of our encounter services here, uh, Matthew has been telling his audience, communicating to his audience, that this Jesus is the rightful heir of all thrones. He is the rightful heir of all thrones, not just an earthly throne, although he was the rightful heir of an earthly throne. 
but more importantly, he is the rightful heir of the spiritual throne. And his book is pointing that Jesus is the king. Okay, So everything we read about in Matthew, everything we're studying, points to the fact, this one singular focus, that Jesus is the king. Okay, So we're going to look at verses, and we're gonna, we're gonna, we've been in, uh, looking at the Sermon on the Mount, and in particular in the Sermon on the Mount, a little section of it uh, called the Beatitudes. And we're going to read through those today. Uh, so we're going to look at verses, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. So if you would, turn there with me, and let's look at these. And it says this, When he, meaning Jesus, saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began teaching them, saying, The poor in spirit are blessed, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Those who mourn are blessed, for they will be comfort, comforted. The gentle are blessed, for they will inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed, for they will be filled. The merciful are blessed, for they will be shown mercy. The pure in heart are blessed, for they will see God. The peacemakers are blessed, for they will be called sons of God. Those who are persecuted, and these are the verses we're going to look at today, in verse 10 through 12. Those who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you. Why? Because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So today we're going to look at this concept of persecution. Now, I just want to say this. I'm not a big fan of persecution. I don't know about you. I'm not a big fan of persecution, okay? Um, I don't want to be persecuted. It's kind of interesting though. It's ironic that I would say that because... The faith in which I subscribe to, the faith in which I believe in Christianity, the faith in which I uh, am, am, am uh, immersing my life into, uh, Jesus indicates and teaches the persecution is going to happen. Because we are living in a countercultural um, counter posture, if that makes sense. We're like a fish going upstream. We've talked about this before. When we look at the teachings of Christ, they seem to be upside down, inside out type teaching compared to the world, compared to what we're influenced by, right? So as we look at this, we are going to stand out. If we're living out these principles, if we're allowing the Holy Spirit to be seated on the throne of our hearts and allowing Him control of our lives, and He's producing these things within us, right? Um, we are going to stand out. We are going to, we're going to, um, and, we're, and we're going to get into this a little bit more here, but we're going to be noticed. And it's not something we're intentionally trying to draw, you know, attention to ourselves, but it's more so of who we are. That's just, we're being. That's who we are. Not so much doing, but we're, we're being. And so that's going to cause persecution. Uh, I just want to share with you a couple, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but a few years ago, uh, it was stated that 80% of all religious freedoms, freedom violations, 80% of all religious freedom violations in the world are directed towards Christians. Are you familiar with that? 80% of all religious freedoms that are being violated in the world today are directed towards Christians. You know, it shouldn't be a shocker because even when Jesus was here, he was ostracized, right? Uh, he was ostracized. He was put to death uh, because of his radical teaching, right? Uh, we would call it radical. The world calls it radical, but it's the norm. It's the norm, right? Compare uh, the norm of, of how we live as his children. But... He was ostracized. He was persecuted, right? After his death and resurrection, as the early church began to form, as believers, as other people began to place their faith and trust into Christ, into this Jesus, as his disciples went out and preached this gospel, this, this message, people began to get saved. At, there was a big persecution that took place. They were all kind of in Jerusalem, were centered in Jerusalem, where it all took place. And if you remember the whole story, they begin to be, become persecuted. This is uh, early church history as well. They begin to get persecuted, and as they became persecuted, they just literally dispersed throughout all regions of the world. Now you look at that and say, why would God ever allow that to happen? Well, one of the good, great benefits of that taking place was it literally took Christianity and dispersed it throughout the whole world. 
Otherwise, it would have stayed in that one nucleus, right? But it didn't. It was dispersed throughout the whole world. And so then Christianity became, dom or became influential in the, in the uh, other regions of the world. But nevertheless, you have people like Nero. And this is first century you know, Christianity. You have people like Nero that would take Christians. You know, it, was a, it was against the law to, to believe, to place your faith in the way, into Jesus, this person of Jesus. And so he would take Christians and pour tar on them and light them on fire, put them on sticks, light them on fire, and use them as human torches. Absolutely incredible. Absolutely just hideous. Hideous. That's persecution. Or they would take Christians and they would put them in the arena and they would literally let them run from the run for their lives as they would put in uh, you know vicious animals and things like that that would chase them and literally kill them while thousands of people would sit around and just cheer and find this entertainment. Absolutely insane. But for hundreds of years, thousands of years, Christians, we Christians, are being persecuted. We're being martyred. Now, in America, we haven't really faced that that much. Now, and it's interesting the things that we get riled up about, and we say, well, that's persecution. It's very interesting, uh, because it's really not the same persecution that the world faces, other Christians face in, in this world, where their life is literally put on the line uh, when, they, when they state that they're a follower of Jesus. But it's very interesting what we would label sometimes as persecution. I would, I would be curious on how you would define persecution as a Christian. How would you define it? Have you ever been persecuted? Could you say within your life, and I, I don't know, I'm you know, just kind of asking, presenting the question, how has your faith ever been persecuted? Has it been persecuted? What did that look like? Did it, you know, and, and so that's what we want to look at today. Timothy uh, Paul writes in Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 3.12, he says this, In fact, all those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So it's not like it's, it's, not like it's optional. It's not like that it might happen, it might not happen. At times, we're going to be persecuted. Now, again, some of us, some, you and I may have been persecuted over things where, you know, we don't like to be called out. We don't like to be made fun of. We don't like to be uh, the butt of jokes. We don't like to uh, be ridiculed and things like that. And we would say, well, that's persecution. And, and you're probably right. It is persecution. But not to the degree some of these other people have, have been persecuted. And we need to be, you know, uh, sensitive of that. But, but the issue is this. As a Christ follower, we will be persecuted in some shape or way or form. Now, the question becomes this. How does Jesus define persecution? Okay? Well, number one, I don't think it's a cause. Okay? I don't think he's defining a cause. Many of us will pick up a cause and we'll say, this is a good cause to campaign for. This is a good cause to fight for. This is a good... And sometimes when we elevate that cause and we raise a banner for a cause, it can bring on persecution. I don't believe that's what Jesus is talking about. Now, is that wrong? Is, is fighting for a cause wrong? No, that's not what I'm saying. Don't dismiss me. Don't, please don't check out. Right? But just because we're campaigning for a cause, I'm not so sure that's exactly what Jesus was talking about. Because when he talks about persecution, he's talking about for his righteousness. Okay? It's not individualized. We like to individualize it. And especially in America, we like to say, well, my rights are being, my rights are being violated. You know, my liberties are, might be vi being violated here. Now, again... I'm not saying, I'm not anti-patriotic, uh, okay? So the please don't read that into this. I'm simply asking, I want you to think. Is that what Jesus is talking about? Is he talking about our liberties? Is he talking about our rights? Or is he talking about something different? So it's not this individualized thing where it says, well, I, my rights are being, my rights are being, uh, violated here. I'm feeling persecuted. Is that, do you think that's what Jesus is talking about? And last, I don't think it's Jesus is talking about something where we're doing something that God's never asked us to do. Okay? And sometimes this is what we do as Christians. We take on projects. We take on certain things and we do it because truth be known, our agenda, our ambition is off. Maybe we don't feel good about ourselves. Maybe we don't feel important. Maybe we don't feel valued. And so sometimes we'll pick up these things that God's not asking us to do. But we pick up these things. And sometimes we can become persecuted over those things. And, we can, and then we can say, well, I'm doing it for Jesus. And this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. When all along, 
maybe maybe you're being persecuted because it's not really connecting with people because it's not the right time or place and it's not really what God is asking you to do okay now again before you check out is it wrong to fight for a cause no it's not is it wrong to stand up for our rights and our liberties no it's not is it wrong to do something you know where we see something needs to be done and we take action no those things may not be inherently wrong I'm simply suggesting, or not suggesting, but I believe that that's not what Jesus was teaching. I believe the type of persecution he was teaching has something to do uh, with something vastly different. Okay, Verse 10, those, are those who are persecuted for what? For righteousness are blessed, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult and persecute and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me, because of him. Not because of us, not because of our cause, but because of Jesus. Now, as Paul writes, if we're going to live a godly life, if we're going to, if we're going to live this life, we're going to be persecuted. So the, there's some things that can happen. There's some good things that can, ha can happen uh, from, from this persecution. And I want to share these things with you today. Uh, and I believe these are the things that actually make us happy, which really sounds like an oxymoron it really rubs us wrong right persecution how can persecution make us happy well here's some things that i want to share just three things i want to i want to share with you very quickly uh, to keep this sense of persecution in context number one persecution can make us more like jesus okay it can enable us it can help us it can facilitate us to become more like jesus okay in john 15 18 through 18 through 20 listen to what jesus says he says this if the world hates you Understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also perse persecute you. If, you. if they kept my word, they will keep yours. Here... This is the thing we've got to look at here. Jesus is saying, look, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. You're one of my followers. You're going to be taking on my identity, right? That's what this is all about. We take on his identity. And as we take on his identity, as we view things the way Jesus viewed things, as we approach life the way he approached life, it is it 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 causes a friction, a, 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 a it causes a rub against the world. This this counter uh, cultural living that, that, that we're engaged in. Nevertheless, though, as per this persecution can force us to become more like Jesus because that's exactly who he's called us to be like is himself. Perhaps this would be a little bit more clear. John 3, 19. Listen to this. This then is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Let me read that one more time. This, then, is the judgment. The light, meaning Jesus, has come into the world, and people love darkness, meaning evil, rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Right? Now, what I'm saying is this. When Jesus came into the world, he came and he came and, he, and, and the things that he taught about and how it was counterproductive, or counter, not productive, but countercultural, right? It created a lot of friction. It created a lot of animosity. He called out things. He called out people. He called out their way of living. He called them out and said, look, the way you are approaching righteousness, the way you think you're pleasing God, the way you think you're living your life, it's, it's backwards. So he literally came into a dark room, if we could look at it that way, a pitch black dark room and literally flipped the light on and just exposed everything. Of course, people are going to, uh, they're, they're not going to like that. They're either going to embrace that or they're going to hate it. And we saw what happened. It cost him his life, right? They hated it. But what happens to you and I as we become like Christ? Aren't we doing the same thing? Aren't we becoming more like him? Aren't we, as we allow the Holy Spirit sit, uh, sit on the throne of our hearts, as we, as we work to eradicate self away and allow Jesus to move in and through us with freedom, through his Holy Spirit and his Spirit produces those Christ-like attributes within our lives, isn't that going to expose things? Isn't that going to expose darkness? And we're going to rub up the against the same things that he rubbed up against. The question is, are we being persecuted because we're exposing things? 
And not just because we're doing it up from our own agenda. We're doing it because that's just who we are. We're, ex we're, we're exposing things. We're, we're shedding light on the things because Christ is shining through us. Uh, Christ is shining through us. So our characteristics of Jesus, these Beatitudes, begins to rub evil literally the wrong way and cause friction. 1 Peter 4.14, Peter says this, If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. So persecution kind of, persecution in a sense, if it's, per, if it's persecution defined the way Christ defines it, and that's the persecution that you and I experience, there is a sense of validation that something's right, that something's going on right. For many of us, we look at it and we say, whoa, if I'm experiencing persecution, I'm doing something wrong. Perhaps that's not the way to view it. Perhaps the way you view it is, if the persecution is, is being inflicted because we are more like Jesus and we're shedding light onto evil, uh, um, perhaps that, I shouldn't even say perhaps, that is indicating that we are growing more into the image of Christ and we are rubbing up against evils of this world. The second thing is this, persecution will deepen our faith. Now, how does persecution deepen your faith? Let me tell you. If we're becoming persecuted, I think that's where we have to do some introspection too, right? What is it that I'm being persecuted about? How am I being persecuted? Is it because of my faith or is it because of my preferences? Is It really makes us lean more into Jesus. I don't want to be persecuted for something that, that doesn't have any validity to it or eternal uh, significance to it whatsoever. Do you? Do you want to be persecuted for something that has no meaning to it whatsoever? Or does it take on a different meaning when you're being persecuted because you're like Jesus, because you're taking on His characteristics? It deepens our faith. It makes us grow closer to Him. We, we draw closer to Him. We begin, now this is the kicker here, because for many of us, I think what can happen is we start choosing what we really believe in. Because the deeper we go into the interiors of our faith, persecution can become more amped up. The heat can become more amped up. It's harder. It's a lot more difficult to live out this faith. And as we do that, it deepens our faith and it forces our hands. Will we believe this? Will we live out what we say we, we, we believe in? Or is this just some... Is this just some aspirational belief? Because persecution will happen and it can, it can deepen our faith. Here's the thing, man. A lot of believers are not, a lot of the strongest believers are not in America. Now, again, I'm not saying anything against our believers, but I'm talking about the people that are being persecuted in the world today that literally has a gun to their head or a sword to their throat, a knife to their throat or whatever that says, denounce Jesus or you're going to die. Denounce Jesus or we're going to wipe out your family. Here's the kicker. Some of us, we don't really, I don't even know if we believe that really goes on in the world. We're so insulated. For some of us, we read about that and it just, it puts a gnawing, uh, a, a gnawing in our stomachs because we can't imagine what that would be like. We've never faced that. And, and believe me, I hope we never do face that. But you want to talk about strong Christians. You want to talk about Christians that have a deep faith. It's people that have a gun to, the, literally a gun to their head that, 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 that they're going to either lose their lives or their families are going to lose their lives because of what? Because of their faith. First Peter would write and says this, you rejoice in this, in uh, chapter 1, 1 Peter 1, 7, you rejoice in this, though now for a short time you've had to struggle in various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold, which perishes through refined by fire, may result, or which perishes though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the second thing is persecution can deepen our faith. The third thing is this, persecution will bring blessings. We just read this. Again, Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 and 12. Those who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. We're not blessed for our assertiveness. Jesus is not going to bless us for how assertive you are how you are a go-getter, how you are a hard worker, how you just go after something. That's not, that, that's not what this is talking about. It's not going to be blessed for our service. We're not going to be blessed for my aggressiveness. 
well, you know, where I just become so tenacious about something, where I just lock on to something like a pit bull, and God just says, oh, that's just so super, that's just so awesome, let me just bless you with all kinds of blessings. Or my stubbornness, where I just dig down and I say, you know what, I'm not moving, I'm not, for the, you know, I'm, I'm doing this for this, you know, and sometimes, you know, that saying comes up where we um, uh, cut our nose for the spite of our face, that does not sound right whatsoever. Cut off our noses in spite of our faces, I think is what it means, is what it says. But it's that stubbornness where we say, you know what, I'm just going to do, I'm going to just dig down. I'm trenching down as if God's going to bless that or blessing, you know, for advancing my agenda or blessing, you know, God bless me and, you know, for making my life, you know, I'm, I'm, I've made my life easy. I've worked really hard. My life has become easy. You know, God send me the blessings or I'm not going to be blessed for working hard trying to make other people happy. You know, my, my goal in life is to make other people happy. God's not going to bless us for those things, but we're going to be blessed for what? For being persecuted. We're going to be blessed for being persecuted. We're going to be blessed for His righteousness, for persecuted for righteousness, um, uh, as, as the verse says. So, as we look at these three things, uh, again, persecution can make me more like Jesus. Persecution uh, can deepen our faith. And then last, persecution will bring blessings. That gives us more of an idea of what persecution is, how persecution functions, and what it looks like in the context of us as believers. And I hope that we never take that and make it selfish. I hope we never take that and make it like about us. Because it's in, in a sense, it's not about us. It's not individualized. This is about the, the only way it's about us is about us allowing the Spirit of God to sit on the thrones of our hearts as we li and allowing Him to produce these characteristics out within us. And we live, we live in that. And because of that, we expose darkness. We, we, um, we, we shed light. We expose darkness. We, you know, we, we really lean into what we truly believe and we become more like Jesus. People look at us and they can see Jesus by the way that we handle things. So a couple things. If we enter and engage into this uh, sense of persecution, how do, we, how do we navigate through that? Well, the first one is this, and we talked about it for a few moments. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. Again, in 1 Peter, he writes in chapter 4, verse 12, he says this, Dear friends, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. Don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. It's going to happen. It can take place in a moment. It, it, it can happen. So don't let it, don't let it uh, surprise you. Don't let it catch you off guard. Don't let it shock you. Understand that we are, and, and I believe Peter writes about this, we are aliens living, uh, we're foreigners living in an alien world. We're, 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 we're not of this world. We, we are of a different world. In, our, in our, the way we live our lives and the way God, Christ, lives His life through us, we, we look very differently. So don't be shocked when persecution takes place. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised because it's going to be a tension. It's going to be a sore spot, okay? The second thing is this. Don't be fearful. Don't be fearful. Again, Peter writes uh, in his first letter, chapter 3, verses 13 through 16, he says this, And who will harm you if you are deeply committed to what is good? But even if you should suffer for what? for righteousness. There's that word again. We're suffering for righteousness. You are blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be disturbed. Peter says, don't be fearful. Don't be fearful because essentially what can, you know, what can really harm you? What can really happen to you? God's got this. You know, you're in God's hands. Paul would write that. You know, the, uh, in Romans, the, 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 if God is for us, who can be against us? I'm paraphrasing there. But it's because our faith is in something that's, that's immovable, that, that cannot be penetrated. So don't be fearful. Stand, you know, as, as you're persecuted. Stand for your faith. Uh, and uh, don't be fearful. The fourth one is this. Remember the big picture, okay? And the big picture is this. We are living in a world, we're living in a time where there are two worlds clashing, two kingdoms going at each other. You got evil and you got good, and they are clashing, they're at war with one another, okay? Ephesians, Paul talks about this in chapter 6, verse 12. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. Guys, humans don't even know what they're doing. Humans don't even know. We become so evil with things. 
Satan just influences and kind of takes over, and the goal is that he hates God. We know that. We know that he can't do anything to God, but he hates God so much that he's going to come after God's children. He's going to try to, he's going to, try to provide all kinds of persecution against us so that we may be denounce God. That's, the, that's his way of getting to God. But remember the source. It's Satan. It's Satan. We're in this game. Remember the big picture. We are in this, this war between Satan and God. We know God's already won. The battle's already been won. The victory is ours, right? And, and, and Jesus tells us the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, the gates of hell cannot stand. It just can't stand against the kingdom of God, okay? So remember the big picture that this is a warfare taking place around us and we're going to get caught up and we're going to get persecuted, persecuted but that is not the eternal destination. That's not how it ends. And then last is this. Refuse to retaliate. Romans 12, verses 17 and 18 says this, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, on your part, live at peace with, with everyone. Guys, this is it. you got to remember. Make sure when you become persecuted or how you, when you think that you're being persecuted, think about, is it really persecution? Is it persecution that is, that is, that is entrenched in Jesus' righteousness? Is it about His kingdom? Is it about Him, is it about him living through you? Or is it about other things? If it's true, if it's true, it's generated by true, uh, living out our faith, by true righteousness, then remember, don't be shocked, don't be surprised, don't be fearful. Remember, remember the big picture and don't retaliate because that's not what we're called to do. We're called to live out our faith. We're called to live it out. Don't repay anyone evil for evil. There's going to be times where we have to allow the Holy Spirit to just take over and guide us through what our next steps truly are. I know that persecution is nothing that we all want. I don't desire it. I don't desire it, and I'm sure you don't desire it. But it's inevitable. It's going to happen. But let's just make sure that when we throw out the persecution word, that we really are being persecuted, okay? And if we are truly being persecuted, remember that it can make us more into the image of Jesus. It can deepen our faith. It has some really good purposes that, that takes place. The Bible teaches us that. So I hope and pray that you will just lean into this one. Um, like I said, this isn't a popular one to teach on, is it? We don't want to hear it. But I pray that you would really lean into it. I pray that you would spend time reflecting on your heart. When you feel violated, when you feel persecuted, I pray that you would just draw back and spend some time reflecting, you know, and what is it that I'm being uh, persecuted about? Is this really persecution? And I hope that this week goes well for you. I hope that you would just take time again and spend in the Word of God, allowing Him to just continuing to, to nurture the seed that, that uh, has been planted through this week's teaching. It was great being with you. Let me just close with a word of prayer. And now I hope you have a great week. Father, I just give you thanks for your word. I give you thanks that even if we are persecuted, that there can be good that come out of it. And I pray that if we are persecuted, that we would handle it in the right way. I pray that we would allow your spirit to just guide and direct, that we would allow you to shine through us, and that we would handle it the way you would have us, have us to handle it. And it would bring you glory, not us but you glory. And I pray all this in the most powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior and our King. Amen. Amen. Guys, it was great being with you. Hope you have a great week. Talk to you soon.